our Father which art in heaven, we are humbled to come before thee this day as we have this opportunity to talk about our testimonies and talk about our beliefs. We are so grateful for the heritage that we have. We are so grateful for the blessings that have been bestowed upon us by the Book of Mormon for the enlightenment that it brings to our households of faith. Heavenly Father, we ask that as we listen to Elder Echo Hawk as we learn of thy ways and as he teaches us more of his testimony and his beliefs we pray that we can all open our hearts unto thee that we can feel thy spirit at the promises which have been bestowed upon us in the Book of Mormon will give us direction and guidance especially in these latter days we know that we are confronted with many difficulties especially amongst the native nations that are upon this land we know that we have been afflicted for years and that we but we know that we are strong we know that we have been blessed and that we have promises that are given to us we pray that as we lean more unto thee that we will know of this path which is sacred and that will lead us into many ways that are enlightening to to who we are Heavenly Father we're so grateful that we have the gospel that we have prophets in these latter days who lead and guide us that we have scriptures and that we have the priest to, to lead us and we're so grateful Heavenly Father that as we are obedient and righteous in all things that as we partic participate in our temple ordinances and as we do those things which are pleasing unto thee that we will be blessed and that we will begin to prosper Heavenly Father we're so grateful for our families and our loved ones for those who have passed on and who have survived and those who have been diligent we pray that our hearts will turn unto unto them as we work on our genealogy we pray that as we commit to them that, in, that our testimonies will be strengthened and that we will reunite this great nation that we are Heavenly Father we pray for all these things at this time we leave this humbly in the name of Jesus Christ Amen
I am here with Elder Echo Hawk in his home. We are so grateful for this time that you are giving to us. So I, um, this is my first interview in in a home for a devotional, and this is so we're we're grateful that you would be the first one for us. Um, but we're going to follow the same for, basic format that we follow for the podcast. So I would love it if you would introduce yourself in your tribal way as much as possible. In, if it's in your language, that's fine. If it's not, that's fine too. Not everybody speaks their language, and some languages are dead. Well, I'm Larry Echo Hawk. Echo Hawk is the name given to my great-grandfather, a Pawnee Indian born in what we now call Nebraska in 1854. He didn't speak English, um, and he earned the name Echo Hawk. It's the English translation from the Pawnee language, but a young man would have to earn his name, and the story behind the name is among the Pawnee, the hawk is a symbol of bravery. And my great-grandfather, as a young adult, was a protector of his people. The elders would give him the name, and they noticed that he had deeds of bravery, but he was also very quiet, and he did not speak of his own deeds. Um, but the elders noticed that other people in the village spoke of them, and it was like an echo from one side of the village to the other, so that's how he earned his name, Echo Hawk. I'm very proud of that name and my Pawnee Indian heritage. Thank you. Um, I would love it if you would share something that you love about your heritage. It could be a story, a celebration, a way of life, um, a ceremony, anything that you love about your heritage, but especially as it relates to the gospel of Jesus Christ. Well, I was uh, taught by my parents and uh, one of the great lessons that my father in particular taught his six children was to, to share what you have to give to other people to bless their lives. And I would see my father giving things that were precious to him uh, to other people just because he thought that they, they liked it or wanted it. And, you know, he wanted to share, you know, whatever he could with other people. Uh, that's part of the Native American giveaway tradition. Um, but in my generation, uh, I think that kind of transitioned into uh, acts of service, which is, of course, a part of what the church is all about. Uh, and uh, one of the great lessons that I learned came from my older brother, John Echo Hawk. I, I call him the famous Echo Hawk because... Uh, he was the founder of the Native American Rights Fund, and uh, he's been its director for over 50 years. And that is a public interest law firm that has brought major impact litigation to change Indian law and to protect the rights of Native people all over the United States. But uh, he was a, a law student when I was graduating from, the university, uh, from Br Brigham Young University. And uh, I was uh, thinking that I was going to be a football coach. In fact, I had a job offer in Blanding, Utah, to go to that high school and coach football. And I thought that's what I would do is be a teacher. I thought that'd be a pretty good life and a coach. I'd played football for four years at Brigham Young University. But my older brother said, well, I think you ought to go to law school. And I said, why, do you, why, do you, why should I go to law school? And, and this is what was important. He said, because it will give you the power to change. And when he said that, I thought he was talking about me, you know, personally. Uh, lawyers make more money than high school football coaches. But uh, he went on to talk about the need for Native American lawyers to, to uh, undo injustices to Native people to protect their rights. And, and he said, you know, if you go to law school, you can bless the lives of many people. And that will give you the power to change. You know, the law, it gives you the power to change their future. Uh, so, you know, I took his advice and, uh, and went to law school, and it really has opened up a lot of opportunities to bless the lives of other people. And he's been a shining example of that for over 50 years. So that's 
become, you know, I think the the family profession is law. There are a number of Echo Hawk lawyers now uh, practicing federal Indian law, and we have made an enormous impact, you know, as a as a family through the law. Yeah, I love that. I think that's so great. Um, I um, I have read a lot of the talks that you've had published through the church and a few other things. So I know a little bit about your background, but I don't think everybody that is watching this knows the background that you come from. Um, would you shortly tell us how you um, came to have the gospel in your life and um, how you ended up at Brigham Young University? Well, my father uh, grew up in Oklahoma. The Pawnee people were removed in 1874 from their homeland in Nebraska to the Oklahoma Indian Territory. But he left there to get work after he was married, uh, and he was working in oil fields. So the family moved from Texas to Louisiana to Montana, uh, Colorado. I was born actually in Wyoming, and we finally settled in Farmington, New Mexico. And I had, uh, I had never been to church until my teenage years. Uh, and my father one day was standing in a line at a business and there was a member of the church about three uh, places behind him. But this member of the church got out of line and went up and talked to my father and had the courage to ask him if he would let the missionaries come into home and teach. And uh, my father said yes. And that was a pivotal moment in our family history is because uh, the missionaries came in and taught our family and our family was baptized and life changed for us. Yeah. The first time I'd ever been to church is when the missionaries took, took us as a family, you know, to church. Uh, and, uh, you know, that was, a, that was a major change because up until that point, I, I didn't ever thought I was going to go to college. Uh, didn't think, of course, I was going to be a, a doctor, lawyer, engineer. Those, none of the family members had ever graduated from college, so we were going to be the first generation. And uh, I think it was uh, the influence of the church that helped us. And for me in particular, um, being able to go to Brigham Young University and get a college education, but I earned a football scholarship. I was a high school quarterback for the Farmington High School Scorpions. And uh, I was uh, recruited by a famous coach. He was the defensive coordinator at Brigham Young University, and his name was Lavelle Edwards. And uh, he didn't recruit me, he said, as a quarterback. He said, you're going to be a defensive back if you'll accept the scholarship. I already had a scholarship to attend the University of New Mexico and to play quarterback, but I decided to go to BYU. And that was an enormous difference uh, for me in my life because uh, being a fairly recent convert in my teenage years to be able to go to BYU and to have teammates that were return missionaries and the influence of that university really helped shape my life. I, I, I think that um, is a a true story for a lot of people that have listened that um, that weren't brought up in the gospel, that they have so many differences because of the gospel. So thank you for sharing that. Um, when did you first gain your testimony of the Book of Mormon for yourself? Well, um, it's kind of a football story because uh, I, I was, you know, I was baptized, um, but... You know, years later, I would be told this by my bishop at that time, but uh, his name is Richard Matthews, and he he told me actually after I became a general authority, he said, "I don't. I'm going to tell you something you don't know." But he said, uh, after your family was baptized, we could see a remarkable change in your family, but we feared that we would lose you. And as soon as Bishop Matthews told me that, I knew exactly what he was talking about, because although I had been baptized, I had not been converted. And I continued to do the same things, uh, going with the same friends, and life wasn't really changing for me. But he said, 
we prayed about it and we decided to call a new uh, priest quorum advisor and we gave him the charge to, to rescue you. And uh, this was, his name was Richard Bourne. He was a lawyer. He was not a sports guy, but uh, he tried to reach me in the quorum and couldn't do that. And uh, he said, well, I've got to establish a relationship. And he found out I love sports. And he said, I'm going to help you, uh, you know, to become a, a football player. But what's interesting is I'd never been a starting football player through all of my junior high school and high school years. But I was in, a, in the uh, junior in high school when this happened. And he said, you're too small. We've got to put you in the weight room and change your diet and I'm going to set this all up for you. And he did. So I worked uh, under his supervision for about a year and uh, gained 20 pounds as I started my senior year. Uh, I was hoping to be a starting player on a, as a defensive back, but the coach listed me as a quarterback. And I didn't think I'd play again because the captain of the team was the quarterback. So we went through two-a-day practices, and I went from number three quarterback to two, and then finally I was listed ahead of the captain of the team. But this was the pivotal moment is because between two-a-day practice sessions, um, I was with my brother and two friends, and one of them threw a ball, and it hit me in the eye. And it was a really serious injury and rushed to the hospital. I thought I was going to lose the vision in that eye. Uh, they couldn't really do the examination because the trauma was so significant. So they sent me home with both eyes bandaged and I was in bed, you know, and I, of course, thinking, why me? Just when I thought I was about to achieve something that was important to me, mm -hmm. this happened. But uh, I began to think about what Richard Bourne had been teaching in the priest quorum and he had challenged his quorum to read the Book of Mormon. And I was not a good student at that time. I didn't read large books, but I, I slipped out of bed with those bandages on my eyes, and I had a prayer, and I made a promise to the Lord if He would help me not to lose the vision in my eye, I would read the Book of Mormon. And uh, so a few days later, the bandages came off. I still couldn't see out of that one eye, but it gradually got better, and I was able to return to the uh, football practices. The season was underway, but it's finally cleared to play. And uh, I went from, uh, you know, being, thinking that I wouldn't be able to play at all to uh, winning the starting position again and within a partial year of playing to earn a scholarship. But as soon as those bandages came off and I was able to see, I began to read the Book of Mormon because I had made a promise. And my formula was to read 10 pages every day without missing and I told myself it would be the most important thing in any day that I would read that, those 10 pages. Some days I read more than that, but I finished the Book of Mormon in less than two months. And all this time I was starting to come back to play football. And uh, when I finished the Book of Mormon, I just knelt down alone in my room and I prayed. And I had a very powerful spiritual experience and knew that it was true. And it changed my life. And of course, everything began to just fall in order after that. I got the scholarship to play at Brigham Young University and played in every game for four years and was an academic all-conference football player starting free safety for BYU. And it really changed my life, the Book of Mormon. And uh, I repeated that same formula year after year. Every, at least once a year, I would do the same thing, at least 10 pages a day never missing the most important thing in my life. And any time I had a significant challenge, I would do the same thing. And I was always prayerful as I would do that. And the Lord just took me places that I never thought I would go. Oh, wow. That's amazing. I have a friend who was just telling us that every year she and her husband read the Book of Mormon in January, the whole thing. And that's that's how they start their year every year. And of course, they read it through, throughout the year, but... I love that you just said that that's how you get through hard things is by the power of the Book of Mormon. Thanks. Uh, I've slowed down in my older years. I don't read the 10 pages every day, but I do read the Book of Mormon. Right. And I'm sure you've got a different relationship with the Book of Mormon mm -hmm. now as time has gone on and you've learned things. So, yeah. 
So the whole family was um, converted at that, that time? Uh, there are six children in my family, and the oldest daughter had left home, so she wasn't converted, but five children were baptized and two parents. And so this, you don't have to get too personal, but I think um, there are a lot of people who might appreciate this to know how many of them have stayed active and how many of them have not, and how the relationships have stayed as, as you've grown it, through your years. Well, the church is a great blessing to us in those years. Um, four of the Echo Hawk children attended Brigham Young University, graduating from there. And, uh, you know, uh, I had a brother also go to law school at BYU. Uh, when I went to law school, there wasn't a BYU law school. Yeah. That's how old I am. Right. So I went to the University of Utah. But uh, the, the church in, in Brigham Young University blessed us. Not all of my siblings are still active, but, uh, you know, I uh, have been active in my entire life, and it's been a great blessing. Uh, I always say the very best day of my life it was not the day the missionaries taught me. It was not, you know, when I finished reading the Book of Mormon, I said that was huge. Yeah. Oh, yeah. But the most important day of my life w occurred on December 20th of 1968 in the Salt Lake Temple. When I was uh, married and sealed to my wife, um, whom I grew up with in Farmington, New Mexico, we met in the fourth grade. And uh, I'd been able to baptize her into the church, you know, in my young adult years. But officiating that day was Spencer W. Kimball, who was then an apostle, later would become president and prophet of the church. And, you know, the counsel that he gave us that day was enormously important to us. And that my marriage, you know, my children that were born uh, to us as husband and wife have been a great blessing. And we've tried to do our best to, to live the life that... Uh, that we knew would lead us toward eternal life and an eternal family. Yeah. Yeah. I love that. So this week is Thanksgiving. Um, I would love it if you talk to us a little bit about gratitude and how that has affected your life. Well, this is a special season uh, of the year. I always love Thanksgiving and Christmas time, and it always helps to focus on gratitude. But I am so grateful you know, for the life that I've been blessed with. And I, I say it's all been centered on my conversion and my temple marriage. And uh, the Lord has just uh, blessed us in so many ways, things that I never thought I would have the opportunity to do. Um, people say, well, of all of the things you've done, you know, what was the most important? And uh you know, they say you had an opportunity to argue before the United States Supreme Court as a state attorney general. You had an opportunity to testify in the United Nations in Geneva, Switzerland, on mm -hmm. behalf of the United States of America. You know, you had these wonderful opportunities throughout your life. And, um, you know, I, I say, well, the greatest thing that you know, I reflect on when I think about, you know, being grateful is just the blessings of the gospel. And, and I think one of the high points of that came when I was serving in Washington, D.C. as the assistant secretary of the Department of Interior with responsibility over Indian affairs for the United States. That's the highest official in the United States government overseeing Indian affairs. And uh, it was a wonderful opportunity to give service. But one day, my executive secretary, uh, Patrice Atine, a Navajo return missionary, mm -hmm. she was my executive assistant. She walked into my, my office and she said, we just got a call from the office of the First Presidency and they would like a meeting with you and your wife. <laughs> and I asked Patrice, I said, well, what is it about? And she said, I asked, but they wouldn't tell, they wouldn't tell me. <laughs> uh, but I said, well, of course, set up the meeting. So a few days later, Sister Echo Hawk and I were sitting in front of President Henry B. Eyring. And uh, he was very pleasant, and we had a good opening conversation, very, very loving and friendly. And then when he got ready to do business, 
He said, in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, for the rest of your life. You were called to give service as a general authority for the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints and to give service in the first quorum of the 70. And, uh, of course, you know, I said, we accept. And that's been one of the greatest things that has ever occurred in my entire life mm-hmm. is... Uh, the opportunity to serve at that level, to be among the prophets and apostles of the church. I just can't believe when I think about gratitude, all of the blessings that we've had in our lives, but that was very special. Yeah. How do you see the connection between gratitude and service? I think they're closely connected because I think when you serve other people, I think the Lord is mindful of what you're doing to try to help other people and returns those uh, blessings upon you as you're thinking and about how can I help other people and loving them and trying to make their lives better. You know, the dividend comes from the Lord that he returns those blessings to you and you know where they're coming mm-hmm. from. And that's why your heart is filled with gratitude. Yeah. Have you... Um had any experiences you've done some mighty things in your life and and i recognize that the (laughs) you didn't plan on them at all when you were a kid these have just happened but what are some of the small things that you've done in your life the the small service things um and how have they affected you how has somebody done something for you some small service and how has that affected you Oh, boy, there's been so many things through the years. But, uh, you know, one of the one of the acts of service is uh, that I'll just spotlight uh, is that when I received that call to serve as a general authority, President Eyring said something that I didn't understand. You know, after we I said we accept the call, he said, you probably want to sell your home. I learned that the reason that he said that is because the General Authority 70, they are sent to the far corners of the earth to serve in area presidencies. And we happened to be sent to the Philippines. But my neighbor walked over across the street and he said, "Uh, you don't need to sell your home. He said, we'll. We will take care of this home. And and he did. Uh, for three years that we were assigned to serve in the Philippines in the area presidency, we didn't have to worry about our home. And of course, we offered to pay him, and he said no. So you can see that impacted me because I get pretty emotional thinking about that because it was a lot of work, you might imagine, for him to take on the responsibility of making sure no one was living here. But, you know, he would do this uh, weekly to come over here, inspect the home, and make sure everything was okay. What a great neighbor. I bet you have an even greater love for him and maybe even the rest of your neighbors because of that. Um. Uh, there's just a lot of good people that uh, live in our neighborhood. Uh, we've enjoyed, you know, uh, serving with them, and they have blessed our lives in many ways through the years. Yeah. Um, so what, what's your calling at church right now? Well, uh, Be- I- Okay, maybe you should explain first. So you were a general seven, a general authority in the seventy, and then you were you are now emeritus, right? And that, but that means you get to come back to your ward on for yes. most of the Sundays. So the rule presently is that when a general authority seventy reaches the age of seventy, they will be released from full time service in the October conference following their birthday. So for me, that happened in October of 2018. You're still a general authority, but you're declared emeritus status, so you're not having the full-time assignments like state uh, conferences and mission tours and special devotionals and 
serving on committees of the church. Uh, so the church can still ask us to do things. And recently I, I was asked to go to Oklahoma, you know, for, uh, for the museum. But, but uh, I serve as a sealer uh, in the Provo Temple. Uh, when a general authority is set apart, when he's called and set apart, he's given by a member of the First Presidency the sealing power. And they also give you a card that says that you are authorized to perform sealings at any temple in the world. And so, you know, we do not, uh, every temple has a complement of sealers, you know, a certain number that they can have, but General Authority 70 are on top of that. We're like icing on the cake. We just, so they, they actually call us and ask us if we'd be willing to come and serve and do sealings. So, in addition to that, I'm a primary teacher. And do you love it? Which ages do you teach? Uh, seven years. Oh, getting ready for baptism. Oh, I love it. So great. Uh, do any of your grand grandchildren live near you? Uh, yes. In fact, we've got two here in Orem, and it's a joy to see them uh, living their lives and developing and We've got, uh, I just on Saturday watched uh, my grandson run in the Southwest Regional Championship. He's a cross-country runner. And they were talking about Native American runners. Yeah. And, uh, you know, they were spotlighting some of the Native Americans coming that were in that race from New Mexico. And uh, didn't mention my grandson, but... As the race proceeded, and it was all on video, so I was able to watch it, uh, he was leading. Yeah. He was winning. And uh, they kept saying his name, Echo Hawk, and I don't think the announcers figured out that he was Native American. That was, I almost wanted to scream, that is not an Irish name. <laughs> you know, he's Native American. You've been talking about Native American runners, but you don't even recognize him. But uh, at the very end, he was he lost uh, by half a stride. Oh, wow. uh, a runner passed him right at the end. But you know he's got a future. He's a junior, yes. and the boy that beat him is a senior. And this these were runners from Nevada, New Mexico, Arizona, Colorado, Utah. So that's pretty good. That's, that's really good. Um, I love that. So shifting gears one another time. I would love if you would talk to us about the love of our Savior for each of us individually and how we can look for that in our lives and how we can share that with other people in our lives. Well, one of my favorite things, moments in the Philippines is I was in a state conference. There was a young uh, woman, a Filipina, speaking, and she said something that really caught my attention. She said, um, if you're having a perfect life, the plan of salvation is not working for you. We were meant to come to this earth to experience the trials and tribulations of life. It's not supposed to be a perfect life. Uh, we're going to stumble. We're going to fall. Uh, you know, at times we will struggle. But, you know, what's important is to know that we have a loving Heavenly Father and His Son, Jesus Christ, and they know us and love us and are there to help us navigate along because we're supposed to be tried and tested. And I think that was her message that day is, you know, this life is not going to be perfect. It's not perfect for Elder Echo Hawk and Sister Echo Hawk. Of our 30 grandchildren uh, and six children, they're not having perfect lives. You know, some of them are near perfect. Yeah. They're doing great. Others are struggling. but. I know that Heavenly Father knows each and every one of us, every one of them, and is there to help him if they will reach out. They can be the recipients of that great love. I love that you just talked about that it's not supposed to be easy. I mean, the Book of Mormon tells us that there's supposed to be opposition. There's supposed to be the, the um, so that we can know the good and the, and the bad, the hard and the easy, so we can so we can be able to juxtapose those things. So yeah, I really appreciate that. Um, yeah, what, um, 
and and we've just talked too about some of the of advice how to get through the hard things like having gratitude and using the scriptures are there other things of advice that you can add to that because i think there are a lot of people as the holidays come up some people it's really hard for them because they've lost someone or they've lost opportunities or whatever what other things can they do to strengthen their testimonies and draw near to the Savior, even when it's hard? Well, you know, continue to be on your knees and being prayerful and just know that you have a loving Heavenly Father there. I'd like to share an experience that just popped into my mind as you're asking that question. In 1990, I was elected as the Attorney General of Idaho. It was the first American Indian in United States history to win a statewide state constitutional office like governor, lieutenant governor, Secretary of State, Attorney General. So that was like the high point. Four years later, I ran for governor, and I had very high uh, polling numbers. As we went into that uh, final uh, day of the election, I was like six points up in every poll that I saw. And uh, I remember Governor Andrus uh, came down to the office of the Attorney General and just walked in. He was a four-term governor, former Secretary of Interior, and he walked into my office and he said, uh, I just want to shake your hand. He reached out and he said, tomorrow you will be elected governor of Idaho and you will be the first American Indian in United States history to hold that off. And I felt that I was because, you know, I was ahead in all polls and... Uh, that night, the, the uh, results came in, and I lost a close election, and I had to get up and give a concession speech. And you'd think if you knew that you were going to win, you were just certain that you were going to win, and then you didn't, you'd be totally devastated, you know, because I'd put in a lot, a yeah. lot of work into that. But that night as I stood up, I just couldn't believe it. I just had such great peace. It's like I just wanted to pinch myself and think, what's, what's going on? I should be feeling disappointment, I'm, but I'm not. And I just think that's the peace that comes to you through the Spirit, that you, you did this for the right reasons, and the Lord has a plan for you, but this isn't it. You know, and I just didn't understand how I could have those kind of feelings that night. But the very next morning, uh, I got a call from the uh, dean of the BYU Law School. And I thought that was kind of strange. You're calling early in the morning. I just lost a major election last night that I thought I was going to win. And his name was uh, Dean Reese Hansen. And he said, sorry, you didn't win. We were all certain you would win. But we'd like to hire you to teach law at BYU. And, of course, I said, oh, that's unthinkable. I couldn't do that. I just ran for governor. I'm not leaving the state. But eventually, you know, they did coax me into coming to BYU to teach law school. And it just put me on a different path. You know, that would, uh, I was able to teach at the BYU Law School for 15 years. Two of my sons, you know, were admitted to law school there. And, you know, I was called to be a bishop and then thereafter be a stake president and all of these blessings that came with it. And sometimes you think, you know more than the Lord, but I think the Lord knew, you know, what I needed to do. Yeah. And to be then called to be a general authority. Uh, if you ask me, would you have rather been the governor, you know, of the state of Idaho, or would you rather be a general authority 70? It's not even close. I love that. Thank you for sharing that. Um, before we get to the final question, is there, are there any scriptures that come to mind or even any general authority talk? I guess even a local talk. Have there been any general, um, any, any thoughts about how we can, um, how you have found God in talking to you specifically through the scriptures or through a general authority, like a general conference talk, something that has touched you specifically. 
Well, um, I mentioned about the best day of my life was being married and sealed in the temple and Spencer W. Kimball was officiating. And I'll just tell you what he said that day that had enormous impact. He said, uh, as we were getting ready to kneel at the altar of the temple, he said, in a few moments, you're going to be kneeling here at the altar of the temple. And I'm just going to tell you that you're starting, you know, at a marriage, a married couple, and you'll be a family when this ordinance is completed. And you're going to go through life and you're going to make tens of thousands of decisions. And he said, let me just name a few of them. He said, uh, every time that you receive income, you'll have to decide whether or not you're going to be a full tithe payer. Every Sabbath uh, morning, you're going to have to decide whether or not you're going to suit up and go to church and partake of, you know, the uh, sacrament. Uh, every time a bishop or a stake president calls you in and asks you to do something, you're going to have to decide whether you're going to accept uh, you're going to have to decide many, many times whether you're faithful in obedience to the covenants that you make in the, in the temple today. And uh, he said, I'm going to suggest to you that if you go through life and you're making those decisions one at a time, you're in for a pretty tough ride. But he said, I'd just also suggest that today, as the two of you kneel at the altar, that you make one decision about who you are. Are you a member of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints and a true disciple of the Lord Jesus Christ? And if you can answer that one question, all of the other decisions are already made for you. And I think that's pretty good advice, is don't debate it, you know, every time about whether or not you're going to do this or that. Be firm in your decision, this is who I am. And one of the scriptures that I love in, in the uh, third Nephi, a lot of scriptures come to mind, but uh, I am a disciple of Jesus Christ, the Son of God, and I have been called of him to declare his word among his people that they may have everlasting life. And we all have that opportunity to be disciples of the Lord Jesus Christ and to declare his word and to bless the lives of others so they can have eternal life. Thank you. I love that. Unless there's something else that you would like to share, we'll have our final question. Is there anything else that you feel inspired to share with us? I just want to say that uh, when, I, when I first read the Book of Mormon, 17 years old, that from the very beginning, uh, as I was made that commitment to read 10 pages a day, I was reading the title page, and it said, the Book of Mormon is written, into the, written to the Lamanites, uh, a remnant of the house of Israel. And that got my attention from the very beginning, and as I read night after night, I would read about... Uh, you know, the destiny of the people of the Book of Mormon. And I actually, uh, in later times, as I would reread the Book of Mormon, I would mark in a red pencil all of the important scriptures that apply to anyone. But whenever I came to a passage that related to the descendants of the people of the Book of Mormon, I'd mark in yellow. Because I felt like that book, the Book of Mormon, had a special message for me because of my heritage. And for all of those that share that heritage of being indigenous people in the Americas, you know, that book was written to you. I remember meeting with President Boyd K. Packer right after I was called as a General Authority 70. And he said something that I thought was kind of strange because it was just the two of us in his office. And he said, um, the way he put it, he said, uh, he looked at me and said, you are the Book of Mormon because of your heritage. This is about your people. And he pointed to himself and he says, I am a Gentile in the words of the Book of Mormon. And he says, the Book of Mormon has a special message for you and your people. You need to live up to that. Yeah, I, I definitely agree with that. 
I felt that since I was a little kid. Thank you. My final question for you is, what does it mean to you to know that you belong to the tribe of Israel? Well, I think that uh, I've just kind of addressed that yeah. in the comments I made about the Book of Mormon, yeah. but I think it comes with great responsibility because of the promises that are contained in the scriptures. And it's not just in the Book of Mormon, but being the house of Israel includes all people that accept the gospel of Jesus Christ, no matter where they are and who they are. But we have a responsibility to help gather the house of Israel to bring them to the truth of the gospel and prepare for the second coming of the Savior. And that is an enormous responsibility for us because I don't think that date is very far away when the Savior will return. So we need to be working on that. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for your time. Our Father in heaven, we are all very grateful to be gathered here today. We're thankful, Father, for thy beautiful spirit, for thy love, and for thy wonderful inclusiveness. We're thankful, Father, for thy strength and thy beautiful spirit um, that exists with us and can also travel with us as we go out into the world. We're thankful, Father, for this beautiful Thanksgiving season. And we pray, Father, that as we go out, that we might have thy spirit and strength to continually be with us so that we might share thy love and thy light with others. And we pray, Father, that thou will help us in our gathering of Israel, that we might find strength and spirit to be with us in all that we do. And we say these things in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. 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 So while we were working on setting up this devotional with Elder Echo Hawk, we also decided as a group, me and Tom, Ruth, Shane, Sherry, Jeff, um, Mike, and, and Betty, that maybe I should include some of my own musings like I usually do. So I'm grateful for you, but I feel inadequate to share following a general authority. So the only thing I'm going to share is uh, a thought that comes from the scriptures themselves. This is 3 Nephi chapter 27. Have they not read the scriptures which say you must take upon you the name of Christ, which is my name? For by this name shall ye be called at the last day. And whoso taketh upon him my name and endureth to the end, the same shall be saved at the last day. Therefore, whatsoever ye shall do, ye shall do it in my name. Therefore, ye shall call the church in my name, and ye shall call upon the Father in my name, that he will bless the church for my sake. And how be it my church, save it be called in my name? For if a church be called in Moses' name, then it be Moses' church. Or if it be called in the name of a man, then it be called the church of a man. But if it be called in the name in my name, then it is my church, if it, is, if it so be that they are built upon my gospel. And I have a testimony that the things that we learn in this church are true and that they all bring us closer to our Savior, Jesus Christ, whom I am so grateful for. And I bear witness of him and I bear witness to you this day that Heavenly Father knows you and has prepared a way for you. And I say that in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen.